I got the target area in sight. As the temperature drops, the Coast Guard deploys a cutter out to the icy Bering Sea. Somebody has to go out and save the fishermen. I think it's us. On Raspberry Island, two hunters are stranded in the freezing Alaskan night. Automatically makes me think, oh boy, this is, you know, someone could be pretty hurt. And in Sitka, the rescue team rushes to the aid of a man shot in the back. We were going about 190, 195 miles an hour. So, man, I hope we can get there in time. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, 350 highly trained men and women risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. I'm Lieutenant David Berkey, stationed here at Air Station Sitka, one of the pilots. Today we are doing a central patrol, which includes Sitka, Petersburg, Wrangell. We're just going along, and all of a sudden we heard Sector Juno talking to somebody that was in distress. Mayday, Mayday. This is Ivy Joe. Can anybody hear me? Vessel in distress, this is Coast Guard Sector Juno. What is your position and nature of distress? Over. We are on the ridge on the north side of Hawk Inlet. The victim's got a gunshot wound right in the back. Gunshot wounds. What was running through my head specifically today when we did hear that he was shot in the back was his man, I hope this guy can make it 45 minutes till we get there. Are you getting the litter ready? Is that what we're planning on? Yes, sir. Okay. When we got the call, we were 110 miles away and we immediately turned that direction and we were fortunate to have about a 20, 25 knot tailwind. So over the ground, we were going 170 knots, which is about 190, 195 miles an hour. So, man, I hope we can get there in time. Okay, we're about 500 feet up the hill. We're going to head down to the beach. All right, so they're moving to the beach, guys. Roger. Well, if they're moving, I'm hopefully he's still pretty stable. Yeah. For this star case especially, it's a gunshot wound. We think that there's a very finite amount of time that we can we can be helpful for this patient. And so we're flying the plane as fast as it can go, and you're trying to do everything you can so that when you get on scene, you can be as quick as possible and get the guy to medical care. Most likely, you know, the guy's not going to be ambulatory, so we're looking at a hoist with a litter, getting him into the cabin, and then all sorts of trauma in the back. All right, this guy is bleeding. Close. I do. We had about a 40 minute plus transit time, so I had quite a bit of time to get my medical gear together. We heard that he was shot in the back, you know, there's a lot of vital organs in your torso. And mentally I'm preparing, I'm just doing a checklist of what I might need in case the worst case scenario happens where my survivor is starting to crash or get on scene, he's in a bad way. Ready to go in the back. Roger. Okay, so I'm looking for the folks on the beach, I think I got him. He's got door speed. Roger, yeah, door's going up. Correct. One is the victim, the other one is fine. Yeah, those are the people you're looking for. We saw two people on the shore, and I was surprised that a gunshot wound that the guy was, was standing up. All right, Roger, what was he shot with? A 30 out 6 at 50 yards. He with a 30 out 6 at 50 yards. He's walking. A 30 out 6 is a, a 30 caliber bullet. It has really good ballistics and shoots really well, so a lot of hunters use it. And there, it, it packs quite the wallop. Hoist all. Hoist all. Roger, we got about 15 feet of rotor clearance. Uh, uh, sure. We could almost land right here. There was just a little skinny strip of beach, and the closer we got to it, we saw it was big enough to, hey, let's give it a try to see if we can land. Are we over the water on your side? Yeah. Problem. It's going to be that price terrain. Okay, you can Right wheel touched. Flight man cleared me out. Had my load and go medical kit with me. Uh, made patient contact. 
As soon as John was able to hop out of the aircraft, we took off just to give him some space to be able to talk without all the rotor noise and rotor wash and all that. I asked him where he'd been shot, he turned around and showed me the entry wound. I asked him if he has any trouble breathing because it was probably at the lower end of where his right lung, lower lobe would be. I asked him if he was in pain. He said, oh, yeah, of course, you know, it hurt. <laughs> Anytime we can land, it's a safer evolution than hoisting. It makes you a little on edge because that was a tight beach and the left wheel was almost in the ocean and then out the right side were all the trees where the rotor tips were. So we had to be careful to make sure we didn't mess that one up. The gunshot victim, we wanted him to get to the hospital as soon as possible. And it, it just saved us a lot of time being able to land. So patients in the cabin, and I want to get a quick picture of you know exactly what his vitals are doing. Cut his clothes away so I could see the wound. I wanted to inspect the wound to make sure that there wasn't any gurgling or anything that it had gotten into his lungs. His wound looked remarkably good. It had pretty much sealed up all his subcutaneous tissues. Very, very little blood. I could see the projectile just protruding into his skin. No exit wound at all. You know, I told him he's lucky. And he thanked us. <laughs> Assessing the patient in route, he notified me that he urinated blood about a half hour prior. So that got me thinking, you know, that he was bleeding internally. I made sure that he had high flow, positive pressure, O2 on his face. It helps ease anxiety, and also if he did have a hole in his lung, it's positive pressure. I was monitoring his vitals with the life pack, and everything was good. You know, blood pressure was good, heart rate was good, you know, O2 sap was good. All right, so my theory is it's a bullet passed through some internal organs, but it didn't hit his lungs. He's breathing fine. I don't see any gurgling coming out at all. The Coast Guard H60 is very small in the back, very cramped. The things that they do back there is pretty amazing. And EMS is there, John. Roger. And uh, we can be on deck here in about three minutes as you're ready for approach. Roger. There's so very little workspace, and the mobility of being able to get around a patient, it's pretty tough. So they do great work back there. Sector 6030, working on deck off list. Roger, on deck at uh, Juno. You go to open door, Chris. Right, right on. Getting that gunshot victim out of the woods. It was something completely outside the box of what I usually experience in my job. It just made it that much more intense. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't always go so smooth. So in that particular moment, it's just a huge relief, you know, because you did your best and you gave them off to somebody who has more experience and better care than you. You know, it's exciting every time something like this happens. It just resets your drive to continue to train hard and be the best you can possibly be. And I think that everybody else in the crew feels the same way. Cutter Sherman, we're going to spend our time up here in the Bering Sea and making sure that the fishermen out there are safe. So boarding them, checking their uh, safety requirements, protecting America's interests at sea. You got a 76-year-old male, difficulty breathing, flying to Uzinki. We've got our EMT. Our mission is to bring him back here to the airport. Zero three zero overheard Sector Juno talking to somebody on channel one six in regards to a gunshot wound to the back. Six zero three zero self diverted. 
Upon arriving on scene, they observed a 25-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the back. The rescue swimmer did a quick evaluation and took uh, the shot hunter to Juno, where awaiting EMS transported the guy to the hospital. We are trained to help. We want to help. We're doing this job to help. So there's excitement. The mission's done. And now we pretty much reset and get ready for the next one. Was this for the green beans or was this for the sauce? Uh, that was for the sauce. I'm Lieutenant David Berkey, stationed at Air Station Sitka, and I'm one of the pilots. That's just like daddy flies, isn't it? Every time we tell her that daddy's gone to work, she goes, work and helicopter. We'll get home and she'll be like, helicopter, helicopter. Again. Again? This one is Morgan. She just was four weeks yesterday. And this is Carson. She is almost two years old. That's Sadie, and she loves attention. One of the other pilots, Andy Clayton, we're having his kids over so he and his wife can go out and have a date night in here within another week or so. They'll be doing the same for us. As pilots, we get together, we hang out, we do whatever. All of our kids are the same age, so they all hang out and they just absolutely love each other. That's Kylie, Andy Clayton's daughter, or, and his other daughter, she's in a chair. Our kids hang out and play at least one night a week. You're over at somebody's house for dinner or they're over at your house. So just the community, the wardroom is just much tighter and you just do so much more with each other off duty here. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. Bless the screw to our bodies, hands are prepared. Amen. Amen. The city of Sitka, it's amazing. That small town community, knowing everybody, them knowing you, it definitely works out well. Very well. How's it steer course 215? Ready to secure bow prop? Ready to secure bow All right. Are we doing all right? You got a moment to break? I was good. You did exactly what I wanted you to do. Get a good hard twist. Get a feel for what the boat does. Let the boat talk to you, right? What'd you hear and feel? Felt the vibration. That's us cavitating a little bit. That's putting a little month, putting a little power in there. I'm Captain Joe Hester. I'm the commanding officer of the Coast Guard Cutter Sherman that you see here behind me. For the next several months, we're going to spend our time up here in the Bering Sea enforcing fisheries laws, protecting America's interests at sea, and also making sure that the fishermen out there are safe. So boarding them, checking their uh, safety requirements, making sure that they're, they're up to standard. And in the event that one of them gets into trouble, we're there to respond. My family has been rescued by the Coast Guard. And I'm telling you, when you believe somebody in your family was saved by the Coast Guard, it changes your life. That's why I'm here. He's coming around to the left. Roger, up there on contact Barry 355. Contact the Pierce yeah. Crab Pots. Contact aye, aye. This morning, I asked combat to make sure we had picked out some targets to board. And they've done their job. And they've set us up here for vessel. You can see off our starboard bow here. We're heading right over there to board him important that we see that they're taking what they're taking legally. No dilly dally, make sure all the BO equipment's in the small boat before we get lowered. Once you guys are all ready, we'll break off to a good launch course, we'll drop you in the water, get your people down. All right, let's get it done. Come left steer course 135. Come left steer course 135 I. We just got done launching our CG 180 small boat. It's our job to be prepared, be ready to launch a small boat at all times get out there as fast as we can, do it as safely as possible. Very well. Four six is away, request five minutes, stand by. Stay on course zero zero five. Stay on course zero zero five, aye. Zero 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 five, checking three five one. The boat's alongside, keep caution. 
let's hold it right where you are, because if he comes back to the right, you don't want to be too close. Boarding team is aboard. All right, Captain, go go. Captain, go call. All good, all good, everything's up there. Thank you. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to do a uh, quick limit sweep of your boat just to make sure it's safe for us to be on board. Sure. We work hand in hand out here with the Coast Guard. Farther There's nothing CF better than to have the feeling of a, of a Coast Guard cutter and that chopper uh, within, you know, within minutes if something ever was to happen. Checked all the safety equipment, everything came out right. Uh, had a few small issues with the life rings, but corrected them on the spot, so no need for a violation. And uh, they're using proper release of their catch, and everything was set. All right. Well, it sounds good. Let's get out of here. Great boarding. Very pleased with the guys. I think they did a, did a fine job. This is exactly why we're supposed to be here. All right. A lot of long That's road. great stuff, being a long rowdy. Good job. All you guys, good job. Somebody has to go out and save the fishermen. Somebody needs to stop the drug runners. Somebody needs to patrol our coasts. And I think it's us. A good Samaritan had reported that he had sighted two flares. We notified the A60 crew. They're fatigued, they're cold, they're tired. The hypothermia can really mess with a person's mind. Automatically makes me think, oh boy, this, you know, someone could be pretty hurt. Parachute disentanglement. It's uh, simulating a uh, downed military aviator. It's just a practice drill for us. I'm Chief Aviation Survival Technician Charles Fowler. I run the uh, survival shop here at Air Station Kodiak. You just drop in the water. We'll take care of the rest from up here. Right. Just hang close to the side for a second. All right. So on um, today's events, we uh, start out with a parachute disentanglement. Now that's something we normally do once every six months. We try to make it diverse and still engage the guys because just to do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and stuff becomes so monotonous over and over and over that you, you need that just to kind of spark uh, physiologically and psychologically both. Here in Kodiak, we're fortunate enough to have the tower, so we'll do some deployments off that, which simulate deploying off the helicopter. As a supervisor, you know, we'll use whatever we have at our disposal to test situational awareness and to test their attention to detail. Hey, can you hear me? Hey there. There we go. Come before you. Yes, Coast Guard. There you are. As an AST and rescue swimmer, you're faced with difficult situations at time. You're dealing with multiple survivors, severe injuries, trauma, small children are sometimes involved. You have to compartmentalize this and you have to keep your mental fortitude focused and then be able to get the mission complete and get people safe and home. Thank you, sir. And uh, can you please take in the knee with your vessel? That would be the Captain Sam. Just sitting here at the desk, started monitoring over Channel 16, emergency freak. A good Samaritan had reported that he had sighted uh, two flares in the vicinity of uh, Kupinov Strait. The captain of the Good Sam vessel reported that uh, once he got close enough to see the beach, he could tell that there were two to three people on shore. Uh, the Good Sam captain feared that if bad weather rolls in, or the tide comes up too far that it's going to put the survivors in a bad situation, you know, hypothermia, stuff like that. So uh, we notified the H-60 crew, two persons on the beach, and it's about 25 nautical miles west-northwest of Kodiak. 
So I'm sitting at home, playing with my laptop, uh, watching some TV, when the call came in from the operations studio officer for a possible SAR launch for two guys stranded on Raspberry Island. He already gave us a thumbs up, as in, you guys are launching now, and uh, we ran out to the aircraft. All right, uh, level off checklist. Yep, Roger. position, I was on break. Checklist is complete. Where, where are we heading, sir? There are two guys on the shore of Raspberry Island. They uh, lit off a flare um, in a good stamp in the area, saw it, called it into the Coast Guard, and it looks like they have built a shelter on shore. The weather is spectacular. We had a moon for a little bit, so that helps with illumination on the night vision goggles. It was about, I'd say, about 15 minute transit for us to get unseen. Uh, be advised we were unseen. Did you see um, the people, Jim? Yep, I saw the people. Going out, we knew very little. The, there seemed to be a sense of urgency to get out there. The hypothermia can really mess with a person's mind. They'll take off their survival suit. They'll think they're warm. So it's important to try to bring them back to reality and say, hey, listen, we're here. It's OK. We'll, we'll get you out of here. Call came in from the operations studio officer for a possible SAR launch for two guys stranded on Raspberry Island. That's what I'm thinking at this point is to do a beach landing. It's going to end up being a no hover landing. It would have been real hard to spot these guys sitting on the beach if it wasn't for the uh, fishing vessel Captain Sam. Uh, they had a nice big searchlight out directly on these guys. Do you want that, those, them to turn those lights off? I'm actually going to land a little bit beyond them, so I think those lights might, might, might actually help us. Uh, as an ambient light from behind. Sounds good. One of our fears was to uh, get these guys to, to make sure to not shine the spotlight at the aircraft, because we were all on night vision goggles. So uh, we called them on the radio, immediately established contact with them, said, hey, we're the Coast Guard helicopter flying overhead. Make sure you don't per point your searchlight at us, because some people just feel like, hey, maybe we help them see by, by pointing at the aircraft, and that wouldn't be good for us up front. Do not shine your light on the helicopter. Right here looks good, sir. Easy down. Ground appears to be holding good. Cliff main still off deck. OK, I'm all the way down. Collective's all the way down. What was nice about the distance that we were from uh, the two survivors was just the, the noise, where he can he can talk to him at a reasonable volume. They're, they're fatigued, they're cold, they're tired, so any sort of extra exertion is taxing. You guys uh, need me to stick around, or you got her under control? Cat Sam from the Coast Guard helicopter. We do have it under control. Thank you so much for the help. The lighting did need help us, and you're a good man for hanging out. Thank you. We fly in, and you can see uh, the Captain Sam had all their lights on, pointing directly where the two individuals were at. Uh, if if that boat didn't see them, we may have never found them. I don't know how else they would have got a hold of us if the Captain Sam didn't see them. Roger, tanks are good. Everything is good. Rescue ship, are you uh, got Channel 21 radio checked already? Oh uh, yes, sir. OK, well, uh, Channel 21, uh, let's talk to each other. You head over there, see what's going on. See if you can walk these guys over here. Brad. We try to prepare for worst case scenario first until we can find out otherwise. The assumption was that these guys are probably hyperthermic. Assumptions were that somebody could have been hurt. All right, sir, I'll come by, yes, and uh, go find out what's going on. Roger that. They're cleared out. Just uh, be careful. They're in the rising terrain. I'm heading towards their direction. I assumed that they would meet me halfway, so them not coming right away automatically makes me think, oh boy, this, you know, someone could be pretty hurt. Or, but um, it took a little while to get there. The tide was recently in, so it was wet. The rocks were wet, and there was a lot of seaweed. And once I got there, I noticed they had some bags packed, and they were they were packing up, getting ready to go. I mean, we were prepared to hang it we out. We couldn't get out of here. We're screwed. Yeah, we couldn't get out. We caught up in some fishing lines this morning. And it swamped and it cut the boat motor, and when it did that, it, it just, it, just throwed us right in here, and the bow. Nowhere to go, you know. Okay. The bow went down, and after uh, about 18 hours on the beach, working, trying to keep the boat from going into the ocean and getting camp set up, uh, we were physically and emotionally just wiped out. Both of us were starting to suffer from uh, heat cramps, muscle cramping up. There was no better sight than to see those flashlights coming towards us on the beach. Just two months ago, I had a femoral to femoral artery. I had a bypass. 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 Well, just the Kuhnerman that's the concern you've got with your uh, older gentleman with, uh, with some uh, heart problems. And I've been taking a high dose of Kuhnerman and seeing that makes me bleed really. My blood's real thin. Uh, 
Okay. I have been taking a high dose of Coumadin, which at that time I did not know, but it was out of the, off the chart medical-wise. So if I'd have took a bump on the head or even a, a cut to my arm, I would have bled. I would have been, I, you would still see me on Raspberry Island. We get in the helicopter, we give you guys some life jackets to put on. That's sure, fine. Uh, to the ride back to Kodiak. We can talk about all this when we get back, but. That's uh, fine with me, I'm ready to go. It's real slippery, so let's, uh, I'm sure you guys know you've been on the beach a lot longer than I have. Yeah. We'll just start heading that way, we'll take our time. My legs are real bad. We got all my medicine in there, I wouldn't go to sleep. I feel real lucky, and I credit the Coast Guard all the way that, you know, we wasn't sitting there for weeks or days on end waiting for somebody to come and get us. Please tell them to stay low. First guy's coming in. We have the two survivors on board, and we're uh, second to it, taking off. All right, we got everybody in the cabin. Stand by, let me confirm that with the slumber. All right, sir, we are uh, ready for takeoff. Hey, uh, so how are those two guys doing? Overall, their their state of mind and their health? Yeah, I said obviously they feel a lot better that we showed up. Wow. Rescue 6006, Roger, be advised. We are airborne uh, in route to Kodiak. Yeah, so the, the 60 lifted. Uh, they got the guys on board. They should be back uh, about a 15 minute route. Hopefully they're on deck in about another five, 10 minutes. The uh, decision was made to have the paramedics here to take them to the hospital to get checked out by a doctor. Thanks to the captain and the Coast Guard, I'm real glad that they were there, that they got there, because I get to go home and play with my kids. In a matter of three and a half hours, you know, when sitting on the living room uh, playing with the laptop, three and a half hours later, we land here and we drop off some guys and then go home, back to the family, you know, that's great. Is that the one? Is that the magic ball? Yeah. All right, let's do it. I'm Lieutenant Jason Evans, uh, 60 pilot here at the Air Station, AUF weapons officer. I'm here with my family, Dolores, and my oldest son, Christopher, is 16, and my youngest son, Thomas, who's 10. We're at the bowling alley, and uh, we like to come over here frequently and just get a couple games of bowling in. I don't think any of us are really really that good, but uh, it's a fun place to come and hang out. Look on the next one. Don't come back like this. Just worry about, don't worry about doing it hard. Just go of a class. easy. <laughs> Straight up the middle. See my name is Thomas, and I'm 10 years old, and my dad works at the Coast Guard base, and he flies 60s. I think it's cool because, like, he actually flies helicopters. It's like, I don't know a lot of people that do that. The um, Coast Guard has a really important job. I mean, because saving people is it's really awesome. It's a really awesome thing to do. And if we didn't have the Coast Guard, there'd be a lot of people you know, that would get lost out at sea and stuff, and especially here in Kodiak because of the weather. We weren't expecting to come to Kodiak, and it was a little bit of a shock. But uh, looking back on it now, there's no other place that we'd rather be than Kodiak. And we're really thankful it worked out the way that it did. Really glad to be here. Let it go close to the ground, Thomas. There you go. Nice. My family is very supportive, and if it wasn't for my family, I wouldn't be here, and especially my wife. Uh, if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So it's great to have him here with me. All right. Good job. We were actually talking to the boys the other day about the Coast Guard and its mission, and that it's just not one person that the glory falls on. It's a combined effort of so many people to just perform this one rescue, and it's just amazing what they can all do, and I'm, I'm proud of him, and I'm proud of, of all of them. 
It's a good thing I don't bowl for a living. <laughs> you got a 76-year-old male, difficulty breathing. We've got our EMT. Our mission is to bring him back here to the airport. I'm Christy Van Ness. I am the 2011 Styles Clark Auction Chairperson, and my husband and I are stationed here in Kodiak, Alaska with the Coast Guard, because he is CO of Comstay. Every year, we hold the Styles Clark Auction. We raise money to buy gifts and presents for seven of the outlying villages of Kodiak that are inaccessible except for air or boat. 65, 65, we're here 70. 65 there, $70, 75, $75 right at 80, $75 right at 80, $80. You know, that's really what we do in the Coast Guard. It's all about goodwill. I mean, most people that are in the Coast Guard are not because of the amount of money we make or the glory we get. It's all about helping people and being there and, and being there for others. And that's really what Santa represents. You know, he, he's there for others. He goes and brings gifts to those that don't have any gifts. There are quite a few villages around the island where you see very little outside contact. So Christmas time, all the 60 pilots get pretty excited about the opportunity to fly Christmas to the villages. It's a pretty big sense of accomplishment to be able to fly Santa, the elves, into each village and uh, get to drop off the presents. We get to bring them Christmas. Hello. Hello. Merry Christmas. How are you guys? A Coast Guard helicopter coming in and delivering Santa Claus. I mean, how cool is it? You know, it's the uh, next best to a reindeer and a sled is to have a Coast Guard helicopter fly in and deliver Santa. Merry Christmas! We're getting ready to do a, it's a little uh, fun game that uh, ASTs do for. Uh, little uh, underwater practice. Basically, the object of the game is to take the brick and take it to the other side and put it between the two cones in the gutter. It's kind of like an underwater hockey slash football slash capture the flag. All right, ready? Here. Brick ball's definitely been something I've enjoyed throughout my career. So I still get in there with the guys, still mix it up with them. It's a little bit rougher game than what most people are used to seeing. It, it teaches you how to, you know, gain control. And it teams you up against someone who's matching your own strength. Good job, Ronnie. Good job, Ronnie. You're fighting like a tiger down there. A lot of pushing, grabbing, punching. It's just what we do because we have to stay in shape. When you get that panic survivor, you know, 50 miter and jump on top of you, what do you do? You're gonna have to fight to get back up. Push him away from the wall. Brick ball is intense. Everything's down under in the water, holding your breath. You could rip goggles off, rip fins off, hold the person down. You can do anything. It's like a herd just coming to one area. So we slam into each other. Uh, I think someone said they might have a black eye. <laughs> it's a nice change of pace sometimes. You got a 76-year-old male, difficulty breathing. Uh, guidance is really clear. That's a one. Pilots, Jim, how are you feeling? Very good. Very good. I'm as well. We got plenty of sleep last night. Air crew. Awesome. We got a call from uh, District 17. I uh, requested a medevac of a 76-year-old uh, male off uh, Zinke Island. It's about uh, 10 miles just to the north here of Kodiak. Uh, the guy's having trouble breathing. So we're going to bring him back to the base uh, 
and take them to the hospital. Plan on uh, heading out of here. We'll take the uh, low vis route. We'll have that loaded up in the flight director. If it looks like we can get across through town, we'll do that. It'll cut the time off. If not, we'll immediately turn offshore, take the low vis route around. It'll be about a 45 minute transit. Low visibility is always a factor in Kodiak. Um, so that's something the pilots consider uh, before launch and uh, something that we always have to uh, take a look at. Any questions on the risk assessment? Yeah, that's good. OK, the aircraft, uh, we've got the 05. I'll be in the right seat answer pilot. Mr. Cooley being the left seat answer and the co-pilot. Check your gear, make sure you have everything you need. The mission requirements, flying to Uzinki, we're going to the airport. We've got our EMT swimmer. Yep. Our mission is to bring him back here to the airport. The ODO is going to coordinate an ambulance coming back to meet us here at the ramp. Any questions? No questions. No questions. The medevacs are necessary uh, due to uh, remote villages, um, patients uh, who may not have the uh, access to health care that, uh, that we can provide here on the island, sometimes in the uh, major cities such as uh, Anchorage. The initial call, I was asking if they had any kind of amplifying info, but the only thing I got was he's having trouble breathing and to send uh, EMT or above. So all our rescue swimmers are EMT qualified. So that's what we're sending. The transit will take about 45 minutes. Hopefully be on deck no more than 15 minutes, getting the patient uh, loaded and uh, stabilized. And then uh, about 45 minutes back. Today we have uh, just really low visibility, uh, less than a mile, uh, light rain. And earlier this morning, it was snow. So uh, you got a mixture of uh, some slushiness on the uh, surfaces. Kind of been like that all day. The patient, he was an elderly gentleman, 76 years old, and he had uh, difficulty breathing. Just after lunch, uh, around 12.30 or so, we got the call that there was a 76-year-old male at Azinki had trouble breathing. Crew ready for takeoff. Ready for takeoff. Cobb State Kodiak Rescue 06. Uh, we are airborne from Air Station Kodiak with 05 POB. Every flight I go on, I treat it all the same. Like, everybody is just as important as the next person to be saved. Everybody needs assistance. Call with air and uh, just find out if there's any amplifying information on the patient's condition. Uh, I don't know, it should be in Zinke in uh, approximately uh, 20 minutes. The flight to Zinke, it's a pretty short trip. We were prepared that day for it to possibly be a 45-minute trip. We hoped to fly direct when we were ready to shift gears at a moment's notice to fly the low-vis route. Uh, normal approach, vertical landing uh, to the runway. We've got some rocks up there, but uh, we're in route to uh, save a life, so just keep that in mind. When we first landed in Zinke, the patient was not there. We called the the local airport there, and they, they uh, called the clinic and let us know his ETA, and, and eventually he showed up probably about five or 10 minutes after we landed. Some of these villages don't have the advanced medical care that, say, Kodiak has or Anchorage has, and the only way to get to these small villages is by boat or aircraft, and we happen to be one of those aircrafts that come by and assist these people in need. So when we first got on scene uh, to the ambulance, at that point I'm just gathering information, trying to figure out the best way for me to get him into the helicopter and, and also what I need to use out of my EMT kit to make sure that he's comfortable and, and safe. His grandson uh, brought some supplies, medical supplies, and, and things uh, with him. The grandson, he he seemed pretty pretty relaxed. Like, like he kind of knew what was going going on and what he needed to do, and he just kind of stayed out of the way. Grandson needs to come with his grandfather. He had enough room for him, so we decided to bring him back. When I first got into the ambulance, uh, one of the questions that I had asked was, "Is he ambulatory? In other words, can can he walk on under his own power?" They had attempted to have him do that initially, and he almost passed out. He could not breathe comfortably standing up.
I was initially concerned with laying him down in the litter that it would that it would cause him to be uncomfortable or not be able to breathe very well. Sure enough, as soon as we laid him down in the litter, he, he didn't like it. We made a couple modifications and got him some head support and laid him onto his side. Laying a patient on their side in the litter is not typically standard, and obviously we would not be doing that in a hoisting situation. But in this situation, we're just carrying him from the ambulance into the helicopter. When somebody has difficulty breathing, you want to get him into a position where they're comfortable, and that position for him was laying on his left side. I'll probably be kneeling next to the patient for uh, most of our short transit back. A case like this, uh, you have an older gentleman with uh, respiratory difficulties. Um, it's really important we put forth a, a maximum effort in, in this case. I'll get him on oxygen, maximize this time with uh, good oxygen, you know. On the ride back to, uh, to Kodiak, we're, we're intending on transferring care, so I'm trying to gather some information from him and, uh, and the other passenger. Also monitoring his, his condition. I kept him awake. He, he kind of wanted to go to sleep. I wanted to keep him awake so I can Make sure that he was breathing okay. You guys, uh, if the ambulance is out there, you guys just go ahead and take him out, and we'll worry about the shutdown. Roger that. Well, we land back in Kodiak. He, you know, picked up the litter with the patient inside and walked him over to the paramedics waiting for us at the ambulance. We transferred him over to their to their gurney. We retrieved our gear, and I gave them a full medical pass down on on the patient, and off they went. Debrief outside of maintenance so we can get out of the rain. Yeah, sounds good. You know, it's a great feeling when you return home from a case and you're able to bring a patient back alive and in good condition. It just feels really great uh, knowing that at the end of the day, your, your efforts uh, result in a positive outcome in the life of another. When you save somebody's life for the first time, when you know that your team has saved somebody's life, change your life. The reason people love what we do and come back and tell their sons and their granddaughters, yeah, you ought to consider the service. It's because we do stuff that most people just dream about.